I thought I'd have something to say, but uh, <laughs> I don't particularly, I don't know, I'll just dive right into it, shall I? I guess so. Three, two, one! Hello everybody, welcome to the stream, it is the BNDA stream today on this fine 15th, 15th of April 2024. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and we'll have a wonderful week ahead of you. Uh, my week's been pretty, pretty chill, pretty, I, I crammed out like a ton of games. Like, I had a bunch of stuff on my backlog, and I'm like, I really want to play this. And I just did it. I just got there. So, don't let your dreams be dreams, everyone. Don't, don't, don't let a... Don't put anything off. Just do it. Because then uh, you get stuff done. That's generally how it goes. Let's get something done, and let's jump into today's game. Whoa! Here we go. Whoa, check it out. It's the Dragon Quest, or the Dragon Warrior, rather. Not the Dragon Quest, but the Warrior. Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, welcome back. It's uh, it's another day, another another uh, day. <laughs> uh, playing another game. Um, we're back to playing Dragon Warrior Two for the Game Boy Color. Uh, in the last stream, it was the first stream, so it was right from the beginning of the game up until just to the point where I have a new party member. Uh, we have uh, Nana. As the game says, an art, uh, who, uh, oh, Nana's very close to a level up because Nana is unfortunately level two. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, we're only level 10, or I'm level 10, and art is level nine. Uh, I will continue to call these characters by, uh, the Prince of, uh, uh, was it Moonbrook? No, it's the Princess of Moonbrook in the, oh my gosh. Ah, okay. <laughs> The prince and the princess. We'll call him that for a bit. Uh, but yeah, uh, whew. try to remind me what where we're going. I think we need to basically uh, follow the lead that this one guy gives gave us. So now we've got a full party. We basically have the means to listen to this guy where he's like, I hear there's this flying cape in a tower somewhere. If you wear that cape, you can fly a bit if you jump from up high. Don't you forget what I told you, which we will proceed to not forget because I, I remember this time. But it's a bit of a exploration, uh, or a bit of, bit of where to go, a bit of like, you know, we just need to travel somewhere. So we're in the town, and, uh, pretty much, I think, where would we go? I think we go up and over, I think. And we're gonna be fighting a bunch of enemies as we go along, and maybe Nana might need a bit of, bit of, a uh, assistance. Because Nana doesn't really, she can definitely heal, but she can't hit. We don't have the means to really hit things yet. And there may be a bit of, you know, a bit, bit of, uh, I guess, I guess equipment that we could, you know, maybe get to help her out. Because she just took like nine damage there. You know, we gotta figure out something, so maybe we'll grind around for a little bit. And, uh, just chill for a bit. Um, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, it's been a fairly, a fairly calm, but just getting stuff done kind of week. Um, yeah, lots of games cleared, which is good fun. So I might do a brief, a brief mention of each one, um, of the next bit, but, uh, ooh, we got some big dudes here. The nice thing about, uh, Art having a ton of magic now, or at least a, a fair bit of magic, is that he's able to, like, really pull it off. Um, you know, like, constantly using magic, and it's like, hey, it doesn't catch him out too hard. The main character gets no magic, so... Alas. But he does get to kill things in, like, two hits. But nah, that's all good. There you go, there's a level up for Nana. Look at that. Seven magic right there. So, she'll be, she'll be right in line to heal more, kinda soon. Not the moment. Well, maybe. Maybe soon, because, uh, I mean... Yeah, she gains experience pretty quick. Or at least everyone gains the same amount of experience. And, I mean... By this point in the game, where everyone, you know, has kind of got, like, 3,000 experience, it's like, hey, you're not really too far off the mark if everyone stays alive uh, throughout the game. Everyone starts to normalize. We've got some army ants, everyone's favorite enemy. But yeah, well, other than that, we're just taking the stream as it goes, just playing along, figuring out. 
you know, how far I'll get. I'm having a fun time and chatting while I'm at it, so. Also, did you like he called another enemy there? They don't give a ton of experience those guys, though. 16's starting to get on the end of, like, uh, it's, it's not really fast at all. Uh, take out the... Oh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how this goes. I really don't like the lizard flies. I'm winging the sorcerer. Oh, 17 damage. Let's just out here, we'll see what's going on. There we go. And there we go. Very nice. Yeah, yeah 70 is like way better. But I guess the ants didn't really do much, did they? So we'll just fight around for a bit, get Nana up a little bit of an extra level, and... And, uh... Yeah, potentially get a, um... Oh, I don't trust the Wiz Track yet. Potentially get, a uh, Some extra armor. I'll do a, I'll do a recheck, just like, what, what exactly can Nana hold on to? But she's not gonna be, you know, wielding anything really strong weapon-wise, because, uh... She can't, really. She doesn't get much for quite a bunch of the game. But yeah, other than that, the, the world's been a, uh, a pretty chaotic place around me, I guess. Uh, lots of... well, lots of, lots of things happening, and especially uh, very charged things happening in the world. So wherever you are, and whoever you are, you know, stay safe if, uh, if you're affected by those kinds of things. Um, it was definitely something a bit close to home in, uh, Sydney, so, uh, again, everyone, you know, around there, uh, you know, stay safe, I mean, I guess it's sort of one thing, but, you know, even then, you, you can't, it doesn't hurt to be careful. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, how about let's, let's, let me mention the, uh, <laughs> the games I played of the past week. Uh, so let me pull this up. So, the big one is, uh, just today, I just finished completely The Talos Principle 2. Uh, which is certainly, it's a puzzle game, which means it's not very, very appropriate for me on stream. I don't really like spoiling these kinds of games. Um, and a lot of the joy of The Talos Principle comes from your personal, um, investigation of the mechanics and solving the puzzles yourself. And I know, um... Like, I, I, I feel like, you know, that that should really be it. So, me, what, what I'm going to be talking about is just kind of high level and not going anywhere near what any, any of the puzzles really were. Um, but I would definitely say overall it is very good fun and certainly worth the price. It's like, I've, I've usually had a, a comment of lots of um, big, big, uh, big games have just these compromises and these things that are just like, ugh, like there's just microtransactions or content that just feels like awkwardly cut or things like that. Talos Principle 2 is certainly a full game. It is a game that looks pretty alright. It has a ton of puzzles and a fair, like, you know, a, a ton of content like that and, um, there's a lot of voice acted dialogue, which I think actually really... You know, whoever, the people who worked on the story, it's like, you know, that's a that's a tall order, I felt, coming from the first game, and the first game was very weirdly deep and introspective. Um, and uh, the second game, uh, I didn't exactly find the story to be deeper, but I did find it to be a worthy follow-up, because ultimately there are only so many places that you can really take the story, and so by giving it some... I guess characters, and giving it some, you know, things to do and p people to people to talk to you and and espouse different opinions about. Um, I think that was probably the best way of going about it. Um, I'm not sure it, it didn't tickle me in quite the same way as the first game because the first game basically made me realize that I would be failing captures in the future, where like I cannot prove that I'm a human anymore, and to some degree, I guess that's true. Um, but. Uh, the second game is more, like, what exactly do you value as a human being? And the robots themselves are 
effectively human beings. They have goals, desires, fears, that kind of stuff. Um, oh my gosh. Um, oh, rip mana. Yeah, okay, let's just bail. Rip. And the problem of, of uh, having a character die is that you gotta go to the church and revive. And you can see how much money I have. I have 843 gold. Which, uh, uh, granted, uh, uh, some of these fights I'm getting like 40 to 70. So it's not too bad, but like, look at the price on this. 80 gold, which is not, uh, that's actually not too bad, but it gets worse as they go up in level. And at some point it's just like, oh my gosh. But also at some point, uh, actually no, not in this game. You can't, you can't zing people. Zing is not in this game. So... That's your, that's your kind of oof, is, uh, there's no comfy revive feature. Uh, I'll check the shop again, just, just to remind myself what's in it. Also, remind myself, what is on? Uh, Nana's got the knife, which, uh, I think that's, yeah, I think the knife is kind of the best thing that she can have. The cloth armor, maybe not as much, I think maybe there's a... Is there something better that she can have? Who knows, let's check. I buy weapons and armor. So, yeah, so best I can do is just give Prince Akanic a spear. Um, and give myself the steel shield. But none of that is for Nana, and if Nana is the more vulnerable character, best I can say is maybe just Nana gets another level, and then we just wa wander off. How about, we'll do that. Because I'm not confident at, like, level 4, even though it's like, well, you know, Nana's level 4 is not the same as, uh, the Prince of Maidenhall's level 4. But, oh yeah, she's got Infernos, which is a, um, a group fire attack, I believe. Yeah! It doesn't hit the second person as hard. And, and every successive person. It doesn't hit them as hard as the first one, but it is quite nice, albeit using a fair bit of magic in the process. But also then, yeah, you know, Nana's gonna get a bunch of magic, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, but yeah, I thought the story was pretty all right. I also did like how there was a lot of, even though a lot of the options were very shallow in the sense of they wouldn't drastically change the story, I liked how many different choices and options were available and presented to the player. There's one uh, early plotline which basically um, aligns you with one of the secondary characters in the uh, from the town, and that character would show up maybe four or five times later in the game, and would basically kind of be like a like a unique kind of spin on the the kinds of actions that you're doing, and. Um, and even though, obviously, they're just kind of there to opine on what you've chosen and not actually do anything themselves, it was kind of fun of the character that I chose, um, I chose Helga for reference, uh, and just, like, <laughs> how, how they bounce off, uh, any decisions you make. Um, I thought that was fun. Um, I did like as well that there were quite a number of endings that, um, Felt like uh, there was some choice that ultimately the player was being built up to, even if uh, it was a bit of a Deus Ex Human Revolution ending, where push the button, push, press the outcome you would like to have. Um, it's a little bit of that, but um, but I, I I did I did like the story. I did think that they they did a good job um, going for it. Now, as for the rest of the game, um, it sort of is more of the Talos Principle. Um, it, I, I think it is a little easier and less cryptic. Um, but I think it's also paced in a fairly alright way. It's just, it depends on how you view each mechanic and how well it really clicks with you. Um, the game's broken down into uh, four big chapters. Each chapter has three worlds. Each world has uh, eight puzzles, basically. Um, with... Uh, Two extra puzzles and a, uh, a, 
I guess, a, a, a bonus puzzle at the end of the game. Like, you have to basically do the whole game in order to get to that bonus puzzle. But uh, that effectively means, what is that, like 132 puzzles? And there also still exists the, uh, the stars that exist outside the levels. Um, there are a lot more Telegraph this time around. Uh, they don't just, um, you know, tell you that, oh yeah, there's three stars in this world, and then you just have to figure out these vague things, like one of them is like this, in the first game, is like this very, um, cryptic star, uh, where you have to just spot some scenery, and then we go, oh, that means I need to activate these things, it's like, oh, really? Um, none of it's that as, as obscure, mostly because it's, uh, signposted a lot by, uh, Every world has two stars, and a lot of them have... Uh, actually, I think every star appears at a tower. There's two towers somewhere on the map. You'll easily find these towers, and then um, the towers are usually... They have a hint or something that will guide you into the right direction, or maybe you'll, you'll spot the, you know, the laser that you have to send in some, some way. Like, it'll make a fair bit of sense. Um... As for the puzzles themselves, though, I think that they're telegraphed very, very nicely. They, um, they, uh, okay. I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm missing a fair bit. Um, I think the puzzles are done very, very nicely. They, they feel a lot less, um, trivial at times. Some of the easier puzzles in the original Talos Principle are so trivial. Like, legit, if you, if it's been a while since you've played the Talos Principle 1, Head back to it, and you'll realize how many of the puzzles are just like, oh, duh. And it's like over in like 10 seconds, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, there's a bit of that. The second game, I didn't find there was really too many puzzles that were like that. Definitely some of them were. Um, a lot of the time when you enter a world, and they basically have to tell you about the new mechanic of the world. Um, you know, you, you'll sometimes feel that for like one or two puzzles. Uh, and some of the mechanics are definitely just redone versions of mechanics from the original game. So, for example, the first game had uh, this mechanic where you would uh, basically uh, record a ghost, and then you'd replay that ghost, and it would be doing the things that you did, and then you basically have to interact with the world around your ghost. So whether that's uh, your ghost presses uh, or moves some, moves some things to activate the door the right way, um, or holds the thing the right way for you to scooch past, um, that's now been replaced with a different mechanic where, um, you control, uh, a second person when you look at them. So you can look and basically switch bodies with that person. Um, and so you're not doing the actions at the exact same time, and there doesn't seem to be really any, uh, big time... I, I guess there's not really time challenges anymore. Um, so all, all those, uh, like, uh, I guess the, the, the spheres, the sentry drones and turrets, all that's gone, it's very hard to die in the levels now. Um, if you were gonna die, it would mostly just be you, uh, jumped in water, really, or you've gotten yourself stuck. Um, so there's a lot of that. I guess, uh, the, the gripe with the difficulty is that, uh, every single world pretty much keeps its mechanics on its own. So there is not really a, I mean, there kind of is like a, this world comes first, this world comes second, this world comes third. There's a, there's a fair bit of that going on. Um, but there's no, um, like once you've used the mechanic in that world, it sort of disappears from the rest of the game. It doesn't really come back until pretty much you're you know, the very, very final puzzle of the game, just to be like, hey, here's everything, here's a little, little remix of everything. Um, and that's sort of maybe a little, uh, I guess disappointing if you did want one of these, like, insane puzzles that involves basically pulling every single tool under, out of your, you know, out of your cape to, to solve and, and figure out something complex. It keeps them all very sandboxed, and the last puzzle is fairly straightforward. I don't think it really catches you off too hard. Um, but that being said, I did like the harder puzzles towards the ends of each world, and definitely some of the some of the bonus puzzles were um, quite pushing. They were really, really pushing, quite strong there. Um, also, uh, Prince of Canic got a return, which is uh, 
What does that one do? That's uh, that lets you teleport back to back to hub base, right? This little tiny path, by the way, is actually where you're meant to go. Like it looks very odd, and it's like, oh, it's just kind of out of the way. But no, that's that's actually it. Uh, oh boy, we got a we got a fair fair number of dudes. We're gonna have to inferno us again. Actually, does return? No, I think return is um zoom. It's not evac. Also, I think Zing is actually in the game. I think it is. Uh, okay, I think we're going down this way. There we go. Of these little flies, I tell ya. Um, but yeah, no, I, I did like the puzzles. Um, pretty much the only other things to really mention, um, is, uh, the, uh, the, the worlds are so much larger. Like, I really liked the scale of the worlds in the first game, but there's something quite kind of breathtaking about how large they made these ones like even though there's only 12 worlds and i know the, the first game had three collections of worlds i guess like you know there were like seven levels with like a couple of puzzles in each um in the first game this game it's like yeah i like the worlds have to fit basically like 12 puzzles in, uh, or 11 puzzles in each one um and some of the later ones are absolutely massive. Um, to some point of getting kind of confusing to navigate, but I kind of like that. I, I thought that was actually just you know, hey, if you're gonna if you're gonna make it larger, go for it. Um, and in terms of presentation, you you kind of sit on a long train to go between the worlds. So they they try to hide the loading screens, but it's it's there a little bit, and it's there when you try to respawn or reload a save. Um, so there's a bit of that. Um, quite a bunch of puzzles, actually. You can get yourself softlocked quite hot, like quite easily. Um, I thought that that was less likely to happen in the first game, but uh, yeah, it happens a fair bit in this one. Uh, apart from dying, of course. There was a fair bit of dying in the first game, but... Zombie D. This would be a good experience. Look at that, 169. Wow. Much better than fighting ants all the time. Okay, I think we're almost there. Hey, check it out! It's a very phallic looking tower. It's a groove. This is a groove of the vibe. Alright, so I believe this is the, the Tower of Wind. We're gonna have some new enemies show up and there's gonna be stairs and things all over the shop, so... Uh, oh, <laughs> new enemies. I am casting Infernos quite a bit though, but uh... This one's a bit of a doozy because it is just kind of like a tall tower, I guess. So you're just gonna need to explore it quite the right way. I'm not sure if there's actually any new enemies here. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but yeah. And as for the actual graphics themselves, um, yeah, no, the large environments is certainly very impressive to look at. Um, I like them a fair bit. I think the robots themselves, I guess, oh, I was gonna say they move a bit robotic, but mm, I guess that's kind of the point. They all, a lot of them are very similar looking. Actually, most of them are very similar looking, uh, with very minor differences between them. Uh, this staircase goes up, of course, but I think if you head down here, we've got a chest. What's this? The herb! The herb, the only one in the game. Uh, there's also another staircase here, and I think this is actually... Okay, this is... This will just link us back. There we go. We've got this other staircase here. I don't think there's any other goodies here. 
No, I think we're... Yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> you can spot a dude over there, though. Man, they really want me fighting zombies, don't they? It's good experience, I guess. Hey, Nana's doing a bit of damage now. There you go, look at that! Good stuff now. Uh... But, the graphics do come at a bit of a cost. The game itself, um, is the first Crow Team game where they've bit the bullet, they've gotten rid of the series engine, they've just stuck to using Unreal 5. There is still, you can tell it's the same guys, because they still have that same kind of care to really how they want to, you know, shape their environments, I guess their art assets as well, that always helps. Um, and generally it still kind of controls pretty much the same. I did have to rebind some of the controls though, I didn't really like um, the Tetris puzzle. Oh, the Tetris puzzles are like so easy in this one though. They changed it to basically every time you do a puzzle, uh, you'll get like a piece. And once you've done pretty much enough puzzles, you'll have enough pieces to make a bridge. And the bridges are a ton easier than the Tetris puzzles, because instead of trying to figure out some like combination of, you know, the shapes, um, pretty much it's like bridges, a lot of the time they're reversible, and also quite a, <laughs> even more than that, uh, you know, you can, uh, interchange some pieces here and there, and it all sort of works out. Um, and that generally means that there's maybe just too many solutions, and you can solve the bridge puzzles pretty quickly. Um, the only way that they limit this is by adding some obstacles in the middle of your uh, Tetris, piece, uh, Tetris piece bridge. But, uh... It's, uh... I just kind of signposted a little more. I think we're actually good. I think we can just go up another staircase. And I think again, I... Ooh, but we do have a, uh, a phantom. It's not too strong, though. Um, also, Unreal 5 doesn't really run quite the best. I think there's a certain amount of the performance that just felt odd. Uh, I was getting a solid, like, 4K... Um... 80? But I'm running on a 48, and that's kind of insane. But like, it's... Like, it looks good, but doesn't it look necessarily a ton better than other games? And I think, when you try to add up everything that's happening in the scene, I guess, but... Ooh, for what I can see in one, like, in one go, mm, I don't know. I don't know, I think it is kind of doing a bit too much. Um, being a bit too intensive. Uh... You know, I'm starting to think that none of these floors have anything on them. We'll just keep going up. Oh, okay, okay. They got me there. They got me there. Let's see if we can get the Zomboni out. These guys aren't too bad unless they, you know, they do some iffy stuff like that. That's gonna be kind of weird. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the performance is a little weird. Uh, also, I guess, uh, one gripe, it doesn't respond to every controller on your computer. It will only ever respond to controller index one. Um, I know a couple of games where, like, they ask you to press A at the beginning, and that's when they know which controller or what input you're, you're locking in. But this just doesn't respond to anything that's not number one. It doesn't. And that's a little annoying. I, I wish that was fixed. Um, but otherwise, it was really solid. Huh. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember. I remember. This is, oh my gosh. Ghost Rat, Magic Ant. I don't trust anything really here. I trust the Ghost Rat the most. Let's 
get rid of that ghost rat. I don't like that. I've realized the error of my ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, otherwise I would recommend the Talos Principle 2. It is a 43 Australian dollar game. What is that? Like 30 US dollars? It's weird. It's like in a, in a world of, you know, AAA games coming out and being expensive, this is a very appropriately, like, very aggressively priced game. And it's not... There's nothing extra to it. It's you buy the Talos Principle 2 and that's that. You d no microtrans. I know, I know it's like. It's a bit tiring to say like new games is like, oh, it's the bare minimum for games to not like gouge you. But it's like there are so many just terribly gougy games that just constantly like ask for more and more and more money. Um, so it is a bit of a, a bit of a surprise and a bit of a breath of fresh air for me. Um, I think I have to bail down the entire tower. Uh. Actually, I think I, oh, I, I, I think I can exert one thing on this floor, and that's, is it on this floor or is it the next one? Nope, there's none of these. I, I, I don't think there's one. So I, I hope that uh, the gimmick of this dungeon or, or tower is uh, made clear, which is that the zombies ever we're, we're gonna flee this one. <laughs> it takes so long to fight them zombies. You can see a chest there. It's like, oh, okay. But nah, the trick is. There we go, we're on the ground floor. The trick is, is that there's a staircase on the top left, the top right. Watch your step when you go along the tower's outer wall. Yes. What if I say no? No. What? Aren't you afraid of falling? That kind of recklessness will come back to haunt you before long. So we go along the outside of this tower. That was the trick all along. And I fell for it. Uh, but yeah, no, no. I'd, I'd definitely recommend Talos Principle 2. Um, I'd recommend the first game. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, I think it's worth exploring the first game and really just kind of like getting its mechanics. There's a lot of references back to the first game. Um, and I think it plays better knowing what the first game did. Um, but uh, you can get both for pretty, pretty low amount. Also, the, the first game had a DLC. I don't really... They might make more for this one, but uh, it doesn't seem like there's really any like hard intentions yet. 349G? Oh my gosh. Will I say the letter G 349 times? Maybe. Myself. Do I go right or do I take the stairs right now? Maybe we'll take the. We'll go for it. Actually, we'll take the stairs now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was the big one. Um, other games I beat. Uh, so I've been doing. Um, I was actually playing uh The Simpsons Road Rage on GBA casually, and I finished that. Um, yeah, it, pretty much. It. It's a. It's a grind fest. It really wasn't anything more than. Uh, than the the one-off stream I did, really. Um, but I did manage to reliably do the, what was it, the fifth level? The, the, I don't know what the name of it. Um, 
But I did manage to reliably get uh, $99,999 on that one. Um, oh my gosh, okay. We've got to deal with the Ghost Rat Zombie Magic Ant session again. But yeah, no, that's nothing more to it. I did also, just out of curiosity, start playing the uh, the PlayStation 2 game um, to remind myself of its similarities and differences. And uh, pretty much three of the levels uh, in the Game Boy Advance game are directly based on the layouts from the PS2 game, but three of the levels are not. And I thought that was actually kind of interesting that um, I think the better levels of the Game Boy Advance game are, ironically, the ones that are original, which is uh, levels 2, 3, and 5. Um, it's just curious that, like, they are different. Um, now, it's not to say that the levels in the, uh, in the PS2 game are boring and all the same, but... They're all kind of eh. <laughs> There's a bit of uh going on with them, and I think one very odd part about its design is that actually every level links back to, like, technically there's a start and end to every level, and it's all walled off, but you can map all the six levels together, and it forms a very, very clean loop, which seems like that was maybe the intention, similar to Crazy Taxi having an actual game loop, and they just never ended up doing it, and it's kind of weird, because... Especially for the first level, you hit just a brick wall. There's, there's like, it's such a corridor, there's nowhere to go. Um, it's like they're in the GTA version as well, but it's just strange to just see it there. And especially to have a road that just goes nowhere. Two roads that go nowhere. In every level, it's just very odd. Um, the, uh, the GBA, sorry, the, the PS2 version also has, um, some real terrible physics. Check it out! It's the wind, the wind cape. This is our key item that we actually really needed, so... You'd think like any other RPG would fight a boss at some point, but uh... Dragon Quest 2 keeps it very, very clean by uh... Going no bosses for quite a while. We'll get there, so. Uh, I haven't exactly beaten the PS2 game. Uh, one gripe I guess I have is, uh, you get so much less money. Or, so, or yeah. Like, a lot of the times when I do a, a, a GBA level and I get to like 30,000 before I'm like, okay, this starts to get real hard. The PS2 version hits us around 10,000, which pretty much means this game is just going to take like six times longer than the GBA version. It's, it's a bit of a grind. Um, there's one nice thing, though, is uh, in the GBA version, you would unlock things at a pretty set pace. Uh, in the PS2 version, um, they expedite a fair number of the unlocks to lower uh, amounts of total money. And then they give you a choice of whether you want a car or, um, or a new course. And you actually can choose which car as well. Um, you get to choose, pretty much. So you can just unlock all the courses and then get the best car in the game in like the first hundred thousand and then it's just chilling from here on out and toying around with the other vehicles but yeah uh not much more to say though other than i guess the grind is real and uh you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes uh next one on the list uh that i beat was a uh, guitar hero 2 uh i was mostly done with this one and i guess i can say some final thoughts um but i'm just kind of going through now with a uh, Trying to get some full combos. Um, so uh, I believe, yes. So here we go. We're now at the, almost the top of the tower. And there's more, more Zamboronis. So I think if you can wander around this side, there is a present for your, for your efforts of climbing the tower. Um, but yeah, uh, at the end of the day, um, I'd never played Guitar Hero 2, because I owned Guitar Hero on the Wii, and I just started at Guitar Hero 3 onwards, and I didn't really know anything about the original three releases, Guitar Hero 1, 2, and Encore 80s. Um, 
So after playing Guitar Hero 1 a few months back, um, oh boy, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's got a very nice soundtrack. Um, and I kind of like the idea of every single song being uh, a cover. I like that kind of just presence to it. Um, the art style is great as well. Like none of the other games exactly have that art style. Um, everything's just all wonky and, and angular. It's, it's kind of good fun like that. Um, it's suddenly cleaned out a bunch by Guitar Hero 2, and then Guitar Hero 3 is just a bit, a bit grimy how the attempt of realism it is before you get a, well, Guitar Hero World 2 is everyone comes from the same cookie cutter, t like, t character template. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the gripes with the first game is that hammer-ons don't work. And I know that's like, oh, but it's the first game. It's like, yeah, but what did they expect? So, in turn, most of the songs in the first game are a bit more tame because they realize that, like, hitting every single note is actually very difficult. And in turn, uh, Bark at the Moon becomes the hardest song in the game. And Bark at the Moon is, oh my gosh, another rat. Bark at the Moon is not, like, it's, it's definitely a rather tricky song in the grand scheme of Guitar Hero, but it's not the hardest, and certainly not, like, there's a lot of games with a harder song than Bark at the Moon. Um, also, the charts are generally a bit undercharted in that game. Um, they keep it pretty clean um, and on the beat. Um, Rat F. Uh, but, yeah, I thought that was okay. Um, Guitar Hero 2, on the other hand, I think is definitively probably the best Guitar Hero game until you really, really like a soundtrack. Um, like, for a sequel, it sort of gets everything right. It's like, okay, the hammer-ons are actually fixed and clean now, uh, the campaign is longer, and there's, you know, a lot of, you know, very, very fancy songs. We got a wizard ring! A wizard ring! Also, you can jump off the tower if you want. Uh, so I believe also, yes, we can now use Return, which costs six mana, so make sure you've got that kind of sitting tight. And we can now go straight back to town, instead of having to wander all the way back, which is very nice. So we can rest at the inn, wet, rest our weary bones. Uh, so yeah, so the ring... What does the ring do? I think this uh, gives you some magic, but it does break after a while, so you don't want to be a little, a little careful. Don't suppose we can. No, we can. Oh, can we equip the, the cape? You oh, can. There you go. Doesn't really do anything beyond a uh, certain contextual thing that we'll get into in a moment, but uh, we'll get there. Uh, but no, Guitar Hero 2 is basically the, um, the embodiment of everything better. Um, it's also got the, uh, base and co-op as a mechanic, uh, because the first game is sort of just, I think it's got a head-to-head -head mode, the first game, but it's a very just straightforward, you have two controllers and you're playing the same songs again. Um, so there's nothing really much to it, but the second game it's like, oh, it's got a co-op mode and, and, uh, you know, like, bass parts and all that stuff, and for some of the songs it's quite meaningful. Some of the other songs, it's just like, yeah, it's the the less interesting part, but that's okay, I guess. That's fine. Um, so, okay, so from now to here, I believe we go back to the castle and a little bit further. This becomes a fair bit of a trek, though. This is a, this is a wild trek of a. Of a, uh, a place where you have to go to. And I guess this kind of embodies some of the more mm, parts of Dragon Quest 2 is the amount of walking. The amount of just overworld A to B that you gotta kind of get through. Oh my gosh, Wiz Drackies and Magic Ants everywhere. Um, so, in that case, then how is the soundtrack to Guitar Hero 2? I thought it was great. I know that I I definitely know of a bunch of the songs. I've played quite a bunch um, on Clone Hero, so I've, I've sort of been aware of the charts and some of the stuff for a while. But it's good fun going back into the game and really experiencing it for what it was and how it was presented. 
Um, I thought the stages were cool. I, I liked the, the the songs. The bonus songs were pretty neat as well. Um, and I definitely think that like when people say uh, Guitar Hero World Tour and onwards, there's a different um, there's a different vibe with the songs. Certainly, yes. Uh, I think the biggest thing with Guitar Hero Two and Three and probably Eighties is that. A lot of the, f the songs are shorter and geared towards having a certain kind of structure to them. Of just like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo. I'm not saying every single song is like that, but certainly um, a, lot of the, a lot of the songs fit in that pace. They throw it off a little bit by having um, War Pigs by uh, uh, Black Sabbath and um, uh, Freebird kind of thrown in there, but they're also encore songs, and they can sort of build up the encore songs as being this kind of big grand event, um, whereas I'm glad I got like four steps in. Very nice. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I really liked it, and it, it gave me those kinds of, uh, I guess, I did have that, like, element of nostalgia, even if it was for a game that I've never played before. Um, just that element of, like, these are songs and this kind of, like, you know, the mid-2000s and, and basically like playing Guitar Hero 3 all over again for the first time. Just like that. Um, so I, I, I found it was really good fun. Uh, the Retro Achievement set, uh, like pretty much all the other ones, I do wish that they didn't require you to just go back and play the game on easy medium and hard, um, because that's, the set takes longer than you'd really want it to, because it's just like, oh my gosh, like, I wonder what's on easy difficulty, oh wow, it's such a joke. Um, yes, you do get a, a guitar that you don't get, uh, otherwise, if you don't play on easy, so I guess it's that. Also, then you wouldn't be aware that easy does not have the encore songs and ends after tier 7, making it only 28 songs long. Um, so I guess it's that, but... I don't know, I don't have much to say about that, that's just, that's just that, so... Um, that reminds me of my Guitar Hero World Tour, um, development, because I'm still going ahead with that. Um, I love, I love that the can't cast spells is just an X, so now it's like, I... <laughs> Nanax! Ask your doctor if Nanax is right for you. Um... Yeah, I'm still going going forward on the Guitar Hero World Tour dev. I've not put as much time in it as I've potentially been able to, just because I've been doing other stuff. Um, but I'm sort of getting to that point where it's like, okay, like, let's start making achievements and then, like, fleshing out the the rules and the things like that. I think it's a lot easier to work high level once you've got a plan of what's going on. By the way, here's a, uh, a shrine. So you ask this guy, he's like, the gods smile upon the just. How may our temple serve you? And it's like, oh, wow, a temple. That's cool. And then he just uh, leads you to the other side. Now, technically, this is open the entire time. Uh, we're starting to get these, uh, these ghost rats and baboons showing up again. Uh, yeah, this round is open the entire time, but you need that cape in order to truly progress from here. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, okay, I... Let's just get out, get the heck out of the- oh! Don't you dare kill me here, that would be very embarrassing. At least glad there's a guy you can revive right here, I guess. Okay. Um, but yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm currently at this point where I've got quite a bunch of things that I can latch onto. I still need to figure out, and, and this is the most important part, I need to figure out that the player has, uh, one, cheats off. Um, actually, yeah, yeah. There's only two cheats. There's an auto kick and an auto strum. Is it an auto strum? There's only two cheats, and there's an action. There's a string in the game that actually makes note that it is really just those two that the real cheats. Everything else is just a 
unlock the songs in quick play. Which does not unlock Pull Me Under, by the way, so that's kind of annoying. Um, or it's like hyperspeed, and it's like, oh, okay, like, that makes sense. Or it just changes the note colors. Easy, it's fine. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going through that. Um, I still do not know where in memory the custom songs are, like, indicated. Uh, I'm struggling quite a fair bit with that. Um, just at least the ones that are on disc. But I, I'm, like, I have a litmus test of I made a song with the same name and the same number of notes as another custom song that's on the disc. And I'm like, okay, what's different? And the answer is, oh boy, I don't know. But I'm also thinking, maybe I can spend some time investigating the, um, career mode instead. So, I'm going through that a little bit, but I haven't made a ton of progress yet. Just... Just in there. Oh my gosh, here's a man-eater! Whoa, here she comes! Gotta hit him hard. These guys are probably gonna have a fair bit of health, don't they? How much I have? 32. But they gave a lot more gold than they did in the original game. Look at that, 124 gold. Woo! Probably rolling it. Yeah, 4,100. I should go into the bank at some point. Wander all the way west and then all the way north and you reach this fun tower. This fun tower, I think is, uh... Oh, okay. It's just a place. Travelers, did you know? No. This is one of the famous Twin Towers. Oh. <laughs> Known as the Drakhorns. In the past, they were supposed to be connected by a suspension bridge. But now look at it. What a wreck. How can anyone get across now? You can say yes. But I didn't say anything. Yet. Eh? Oh. <laughs> so I'm not sure if there's actually a, um... Oh, okay. Well, we do have a hole in the middle. Nice. I think, yeah, I was like, you gotta fight some enemies along the way, right? Or man eaters. Um, but yeah. I did not realize Katakura World 2 on the PS2 as well, um, has pre rendered video backgrounds instead of actually rendering it. I thought, I, I was like, oh my gosh, am, am I going mad? Because the Wii version, I, I swear, had real, like, characters. And the answer was yes, the Wii version did have real backgrounds. Um, but the PS2 version, the backgrounds are all pre-rendered videos, and the characters are all superimposed on top. Which is actually kind of impressive of the fact that they have all the stages and try to do it with multiple angles, uh, camera angles for the characters instead of just being very boring and stationary. That's pretty alright. Um, but it also does mean that the backgrounds don't respond to the song. Um, mega P. I mega peed my pants. Is the Megapede really that much more than the original Centipede? Centipod? Oh, he is, he is kind of armored. I can keep hitting him. I'll just keep hitting him, why not? There you go. He gets there. Oh my gosh, he's got a leather shield on him. Wow. Not, not really like anyone will capitalize on that, but... Wow. <laughs> this reminds me of the, the lighthouse from Pokemon Gold. Or does the lighthouse from Pokemon Gold remind me of this? Ooh. Great floor design, by the way. <laughs> we got an enchanter. Oh my gosh. Lots of man eaters, by the way. Some very, very big encounters. Uh, but yeah. Next one on the list. I swear, I've, be I've played all these in the past week. Um, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 on the PS1. Um, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 on the PS1 is a downport of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 on the PS2. It contains, uh, it lacks the 
cruise ship bonus level and replaces it with a downhill bonus level. That's kind of just, eh, it just kind of happens. It's not too, too deep, but it is slightly different. So I guess I'll give it that. Every other level is, uh, to its best attempt, a recreation of the original, uh, games, or the PS2 games level, but, uh, simplified down to a point of, uh, yeah, some of them are just missing stuff, or the scale is a little weird. Um, weirdly, the, uh, Canada level, they, um, added this whole kind of extra section, um, onto it, removing the, the boring part of the, the, well, not the boring part, but the, the weird part with the bridge and the, the cliff. That's all being replaced with a different bit, um, but, uh, but generally the levels are along the same lines. Um, the goals are a little different. Uh, it's got most of the music, so I guess it's that. Um, but it kind of just plays like Tony Hawk 2. But it does have reverts, so it's got that. Um, it's a curious play. So here's the fun part, by the way. We now have this, uh, corner, this ledge. If you head north, if you're holding, if you've equipped the, the winged cape, you will float over this gap and fall onto the correct side. That is the entire, the entire reason why you get the cape. And it's like, man, that's, that's a lot of work. Also, we're going to deal with even more monsters. These are mud dolls. That sounds like, I was going to say, that sounds like a slur. You know, you know what I mean? Like a mud doll. I don't think they're too bad, actually. And they got, a, you know, the regular kind of health. It's like a bit of, bit of health, and they do this peculiar dance, which is very annoying. But we're almost at town. And Nana's level 7. So for reference, Nana caps out at level 35. Uh, and Art at 45, and, uh, the main character at 50, but that's all about a million experience anyway, so it really doesn't matter too much. Actually, I think it is a million experience. Head over east, and we finally reach the town of... Welcome to the town of Leonport. We can now sleep at the inn and proceed to get gouged out of money. 60 gold! Wah! Uh, I don't have a lot to say about Tony Hawk 3 on the PS1. Ladies, get lost. Hey, lassie, you want some chicken? Blech. <laughs> this town hired me as a guard. I came west from Alephgard. That kingdom has changed a lot. I hear rumors now that the king has got even gone missing. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. A missing king. I can't believe it. What else we got going on in this town? Looks like a door, but it's not. Want to play the slot machine? No slot tokens for me. You wish to sail a boat? But our tradition forbids us from loaning boats to outsiders. I apologize, but I cannot. Oh, okay. Man, if only we could get a boat. <laughs> Curious what's going on over there, man. That seems kind of interesting. Alright, we'll check out the weapons. So here we have, uh, what is very nice for Nana, the Wizard Staff. Try using it as an item. The, yeah, the reason why he prompts you with, uh, try using it as an item as well, is that, uh, the Wizard Staff, if you do use it, it actually is a free cast of Fireball, which is very nice. And this is, uh, you know, very nice to have. Uh, we can also get, uh this evade tunic. I think the, uh, or I guess it's a cloak of evasion, but, uh, it's kind of good, man. Should probably save up and have some for everyone. Yeah. Let's see if we can sell some, uh, some existing stuff. Because, uh, I'm, hol I'm holding on to some extra things. Uh, probably hold on to the... Oh. Let's see. Shield of key, warp wing. Oh, it's got an extra shield, he doesn't need that. And then is holding on to a knife, which he doesn't need. 
And... Uh, I don't really have... I got, I got enough to maybe get two of these. We'll equip, and we'll sell a thing. Oh, oh I'll get there. I'll get there. I'm dealing through menus. Sell the cloth. Oh, I can't even buy a second one yet. Hi there, how's it going? Yeah, help, those monsters! They're not monsters, they're just your friends. Kikiki, hand her over. Here we go. Fools, you can join her as our feast. Gotta fight these gremlins! I'm more a gremlins too kind of guy. I don't think they're too bad, these gremlins. Does this count as a boss fight, by the way? They do heal. That's that's the most annoying part of the gremlins. Can't make me sleep. Can't do it. <laughs> and a warp wing, very nice. Thank you for saving me. Please come with me and meet my grandfather. Please follow me. <laughs> the slow walk. Grandfather, may I have a word? Save my granddaughter. I don't know how to thank you. Ah, yes, I know. I'll loan you my boat. That is about all I could do. Please feel free to sail her. So, uh, yeah, there's the boat. And that's how we continue our journey. We, we now have a boat. Uh, I guess that's something more than the first game had, because the first game didn't have any, uh, extra means of transport. Sail east to reach Alfgard. Long ago, the brave warrior Lotto and Lady Laura came from there. Travel, aren't you? Can't go without the items. Oh my gosh. All right, we might as well buy. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll grind a little bit. We'll get a little bit of money for the for the other cape, I guess. Other than that, is there anything? I guess there's a church, right? There you go. I mean, now record your quest. There you go. We shall continue going. There we go. And uh, here's your here's your proper church. There you go. Uh, all right, next game on the list. We're still still going. Next one, Donald Duck Gone Quackers for the Nintendo 64. It's like Donald Duck Gone Quackers on the PlayStation 1, which I've already played. But the levels are slightly different in this one. Also, hi there, bunny girl. Do you think I look cute? Want a powder puff massage? Okay. Really? Ooh? Puff, puff, puff. Thank you. Come whenever you want. The puff puff is a, uh, a Dragon Quest tradition. You must always get the puff puff. Every game. What is the puff puff? Oh, you know. Puff Puff. Puff Puff is the Puff Puff. Easy. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about Donald Duck going Quackers other than it's a very short game and totally a one stream experience if it ever became that later, but uh, there's not a lot to really say about it. It just kind of happens. Um, it's a very straightforward 3D platformer that's pretty much just Crash Bandicoot. Um, does the job, but not a lot to really say. You know, for a man either, they sure don't eat people very often. Yeah, I don't have a ton to say about that one. Speaking of Crash Bandicoot, Crash Nitro Car in the Game Boy Advance. I played this one, uh, once, at some point ages ago. Um, and, uh, so I'm like, okay, let's give it a proper full go. Uh, Crash Nitro Card on the GBA is, is technologically kind of neat. It's, it's another one of the Mode 7 style... Um, I guess, like, you know, 
32-bit races where it's like sprites in a screen with parallax as opposed to, or, or a field with parallax as opposed to proper 3D. But it does run at a very, very nice silky smooth frame rate, which is very cool. Um, I also kind of like how uh, if you uh, go off jumps, it does angle the camera a little bit. So the effect is actually quite, it's done quite nicely. Um, unfortunately, compared to the PS2 version, it lacks its identity a little bit. It doesn't have crazy going up the wall sequences. It's pretty, um, well, it's flat, I guess. And that's a limitation of the engine, but also, um, I think it kind of hurts its presentation a little bit because the, without being able to do that, some of the tracks just, in fact, a lot of the tracks just kind of seem the same. They're all, they're all pretty similar feeling. Um, even the final track is, uh, much more stripped down and sort of bland. Um, the boss fights are a little bit lame. And they sort of are in the original game, but they're, they're very much so here, because it's just like, it just happens so quick. And, um... It's sort of over before you really even think it's begun. Like, uh, it only took me like five hours total, and that included having to play through the game a second time. I'm glad that this is not hitting them. Um, they included playing through the game with the other campaign as well, and it's just like, oh, okay. Get all the bonuses, which are fairly straightforward. You pretty much have, every time you do a, a track as a race and you want to win the race, you then have to go back and you do the C and K challenge, which is basically win a race but grab three letters as you go along, which was very easy in this one, because there's not really shortcuts or secrets. It's just played pretty straight. Um, and uh, then a time trial, which involves going around three laps, and you can run into boxes to pause your time for a bit. But again, it's kind of straightforward. There's not a lot to it, so I think maybe nostalgia might play a little bit stronger on this one, but um, it's not a boring play. But I think there's better games to spend your time with. Maybe you get around to this one just randomly. Uh, next one on the list is uh, Cut the Rope. I played the DSi version of Cut the Rope. Um, Cut the Rope is an actual mobile classic, and it deserves to be remembered in the history books as a mobile game that is not that bad. Um, I know mobile games are very trash these days, but that came from the time of you release like a base game with a handful of levels and then you just keep patching with more levels over time and a lot of the time, especially for this game, they were free to try and encourage even more people to play the game and I kind of like that model of just like, you just, you're just going for the breadth at this point you just want to like, have as many people playing this game as possible um, so Cut the Rope is a, is a classic where it's basically you're presented with everything on screen you got a piece of swirly candy and a uh, little alien monster that wants to eat it, a little cute alien monster, and uh, your goal is to cut the rope. But there's other things like uh, the, you know, sometimes when the sweet moves towards some things, it'll, it'll attach a new rope onto something, uh, you can slide it along if it's attached to one of these slidey things, uh, there's pulleys, there's little fun mechanics, there's also a bunch of stuff involving the fact that the ropes are a bit springy and elastic. Um, so you can actually slingshot things around. Um, every level presents pretty much one challenge. But in this version, there were 125 levels. Um, so a fair bit of content to get around to. The DSi version is, uh, an admirable attempt. It does capture every one of the original five box, uh, or box worlds, I guess. Uh, they're called boxes in the, uh, in the game. Um, it captures the every level completely, but there is a little bit of, like, the DSi is weirdly not capable of doing some things, particularly uh, using a touchscreen is just not as good as using your fingers, and especially being able to use two fingers uh, is a limitation that the DSi version can't get around. And some of the levels feel a bit, feel a bit pressed when you're trying to do it like that. It's not impossible, but they do feel a little pressed. Um, also, the frame rate chugs at times, and the the DSi doesn't have particularly the greatest resolution. Um, so when you do a side by side, it's like mm, there's a bit of the the art style that just looks a bit bit crushed compared to the original version. Um, but that being said, in a world of preserving cut the rope, the DSi version is preserved. It works. It does what it should on the tin. Good on him. That is cut the rope. There's nothing more to say about it. Um, Three more, 
Uh, Big Mother Truckers on the GBA. I've talked about this one before. Big Mother Truckers is a... Uh, I guess it's a trucking game. You drive from place to place, you buy things, sell it somewhere else for a profit, and eventually at the end of 60 days you will have hopefully made more money than your siblings, or cousins, or I don't know what their relationship to me is. Um, and that's the goal of the game. Big Mother Truckers on the GBA is very admirable in the sense of it properly renders 3D. Like textured polygons. And the warping isn't even that bad, it's actually pretty okay. Um, but there's a couple of things. One, the frame rate is like five. It's re it's so low. It's shockingly low. It's amazing. It's even trying to run on the on the GBA. Um, but it, it's it's so low that the game itself doesn't actually do much. Um, number two, uh, all the upgrades are worthless. Um, the game. Uh, tries to make it seem like, oh, you know, you can spend some money on these upgrades. Some of the up one of the upgrades is like you get a little bit more storage each time. You can get about 50% more storage than you started the game with, and that works out okay. But then things like you can drive faster or you can brake easier, and it's like, do I need it? I you can do the entire game without needing any of these other upgrades. Um, one of them is like fuel efficiency, and it's like it costs like millions of dollars to upgrade completely, and it's like, I'm pretty sure you'd probably save like a hundred thousand dollars throughout the game on fuel. It's not worth buying the upgrade. Just pay for the fuel every time. It's not like any trip is too long as well. But that's the whole point of like, fuel upgrades in these kinds of trucking games, is usually it's to uh, catch you out. There we go, we got outside by the way, which is evac, so there we go. Um, but it's like, the whole there's only five destinations as well, and that's another gripe. There's only five destinations, which means even if you attempted to try and go from each place to a different place, that is only 20 possible trips. And the game takes place over- oh, technically there's six places, so, uh, 30. But, uh, but it's also like, uh, one of the places is just literally the HQ, which only just tells you about things, but it doesn't, like, you can't trade anything with them. So you're never gonna want to go there. Um, and the game takes place over 60 days, and you just have to keep going, keep going, until the 60 days is up. Uh, and that means you've probably been there, done that, everything. Well before... Well before the game's done. Um, thank you Retro Treatment Set for making you play the game four times as well. It's really worthless. There's four characters, they're all the same. They make you play the game four times. I don't know. Uh, interesting as a tech demo, not that interesting as a game. But, again, admirable, okay. Uh, a better handheld driving game, Gran Turismo PSP. Uh, I have fully finished this set now, uh, I've mentioned it quite a few times, um, but uh, Gran Turismo on the PSP is virtually Gran Turismo 4. It has almost all the tracks and almost all the cars. It's remarkable that they've crammed all the stuff into just the PSP. Which is very nice, and it's got a bit of a soundtrack. Not too many songs, but a bit. I think it's like 12 or so songs. And you can just throw your own songs into the mix as well if you want. Uh, the, the gripe with Gran Turismo on the PSP is um, it, it doesn't have a career. It's got the, the, uh, the, the, the license tests, and it's got quite a lot of license tests, which is very nice. Um, but it doesn't have a career mode. Instead, what it ends up being is... Oh, I have no space. Oh. Let's give it an hour. Okay, I guess we're all equipping this. And now let's sell the, uh, the steel. And the chain. Now I can equip on top. Uh, okay, item. Pass the bundo. Item. Invade. Pass the art. Equipment. Invade, leather, wind. Oh, come on, there we go. Equipment for art. And there we go. We're all loaded. We're, we're locked and loaded. We're set. We're ready to go. 
save and continue on. Um, for the retro treatment set, there's a lot of context of uh, picking up various cars uh, that have some meaning. A lot of the time, they're relating to an older game's license test, and then basically like, hey, do a time trial and get that time. And I appreciate that. Trying to contextualize the game and really try to add something to it. Um, I guess one problem with the game is that it doesn't exactly have much, like, context for actually, like, playing anything. Um, even, even money you have to earn by... Uh, I love this, by the way. This is just over here. My ship sank in a vicious storm. I was lucky enough to be saved by a passing ship, but the treasure on board went down with my ship. If you could salvage my treasure, I will repay you most handsomely. And he doesn't tell you where. He doesn't tell you where. Keep this in mind, though. This will be important for later. And here we go. We are now setting sail. This is, uh... You hear that music? We have <laughs> we have arrived in Alephgut. Also, the enemies are just like, whoa, whoa. Coming at you hard. Good thing we got some new uh, equipment, or else uh, we're gonna be a bit, you know, a bit in the deep here. I can't hit any harder, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, there's not not a lot to say about Grand Turismo on the PSP. I think it's because if you haven't played a Gran Turismo game, play Gran Turismo 4 first, and you'll kind of feel like you've done everything. Like, you don't really... I, the PSP game is a curiosity, um, but it doesn't introduce really anything on its own, so don't worry too hard about it. Uh, so travel over here, and we've reached... Uh, well... Tan Tantagal Castle. This is the starting, or the area of the first game. This is one remarkably cool part about this game. Also, gates close everywhere. Hi there. Oh, you must be the descendants of Lotto the hero. What an honor. Our king has gone into hiding out of fear of Hargon. How humiliating. Oh, okay. So we can keep exploring around this castle a little bit. See what's changed since the last game. If you become cursed, come see me. I'm a veteran at lifting curses. I'm still capable. Is this the repellent? A oh, very nice a repellent. Hi there. This is the town of Tantagal, the castle and the village were apart in the past, but not anymore. Because remember the the uh the town was its own thing. That's right! More weapons! We've got a hammer! Also, I guess I could get the wizard uh stuff. For, uh, for art as well. Um, maybe if I've got enough money. Um, I think it actually would be kind of the best thing that he can equip for quite a while as well. Because, uh, yeah, the hammer and the steel broadsword he can't equip. Um, I think it might actually be a fair while until we get something else. Uh, we've also got this iron helmet. Maybe that'll be okay. Uh, the hammer might be neat. Yeah, we'll see. But uh, for now, I can't afford any of it, so it's okay. Uh, I probably don't need to sleep, but just how much? 6G! It's priced like the first game as well, oh my gosh. Yacht. Mwah. Love it. Welcome to my item shop. Okay. And he's got repellent and amulet. Oh, okay. Very nice. to the other side here. Is this our church? It's our church. Oh no, this is just flat out healing. What's the point of the inn then? Ah, uh, are you descendants of the brave hero Lotto? Yes. I thought so. Welcome back to Tantagal. Long ago, Lady Laura left the castle on a long journey with a young man who saved the world. I wonder how many years have passed since that story was first told. Welcome back to Tantagal. I thank you. 
the very, very last game on the on the list is a game called uh, Firebugs. This is a PlayStation game, uh, a racing game by uh, Psychosis, I believe. And uh, it's yeah, this is an interesting one, I guess. Um, sort of Wipeout esque. Uh, oh yeah, I, don't know. I should probably save instead of. Instead of just uh, pressing B and accidentally backing out and going whoops. Church, got it. Hi there. Have you heard about the sunken treasure? Yes. If you see the sea glitter, that is where the treasure sank. A merchant who lives near the docks in Leonport is supposed to have been a very wealthy man. People say he lost his fortune when the ship sank in the Northern Sea because it was so weighed, da weighted down with the merchant's precious cargo. Hmm, interesting. We'll keep that in mind for a bit. And, uh, I, I've been up here. I don't think there's really anything else to, to do. A lot of the towns are just there to tell you about where to keep going. I mean, to some degree, that's still just, like, the first game. Hi there. To open any door with a gold frame, a gold key is what you need. I think I might need to pawn off some of my weapons at some point, as all well, my loose items as well. The king has gone missing. The kingdom is doomed. So, uh, other than that, I guess we can explore everything in the first game. This is all to scale, but, uh, there's not as many points of interest, um, if that makes sense. Like, uh, not, not every single dungeon is physically there. I don't really have too much to say for that, though. I look away, apparently died. How'd that happen, bro? How'd that happen? How'd you let that happen to yourself? Just, like, don't die. Oh, this church isn't there. Which one's the church? This one. Surely you jest. Bindo is still alive. Because I pressed the wrong person. 240 gold. This is what I mean. This starts adding up. This is very iffy. He got better though. I think we might need to have to fight a bit, though. I know, right? We're at that point- oh, what kind of heal was that? It didn't heal anything. Um, we might actually have to fight a little bit. We, we might actually need to gain some levels. Because these guys are going to kick my butt a little bit. Maybe so. Um... Oh yeah, uh, so Firebugs is a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, Wipeout-esque. Uh, takes place in the futuristic year of whatever the heck they were on in the early 2000s. It's got that kind of Big Beat style, uh, music going on. It's, maybe it's not Big Beat, actually, it's more like kind of techno trance. Um, I'm losing all my magic. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a racing game where you play as five, um, kind of, Euro chibi, you know what I mean? Like that early 2000s chibi art style, but it's not actually chibi. You know what I mean? That one. Um, play as one as five characters in five player races. And, uh, you go around and you win. Um, there's, there's not a lot to it, I guess. Um, one thing I think is, like, kind of interesting is the way the game is structured. Because it, uh, doesn't expect... Or rather, it, it's it's weirdly hiding its content. It actually doesn't want you to really see the content. Um, so, for example, there are three levels, as in three, like, difficulty levels. You have to do the entirety of one difficulty level before the next one. Each difficulty level has five cups, and each cup 
starts off with a three lap race, and then if you win the race, you are on pole position for a five lap finale race. If you don't win the, the first race, you have to play against each of the other people who didn't come first, so three races total, on three unique point-to-point -point races, and then you can participate in the final race. But also, it doesn't matter if you win the other races, like, because it, it just determines your grid order for the final race. If you want to beat the game fast, turn- well, just leave if you don't win the first race, because you skip three other races. Like, you skip all this other content for some reason if you're just winning. And it's not that hard. It's, it's not a very hard game. Um, which is, uh, very odd that it's just like you'd go through it and you wouldn't, you know, experience that much content. That being said, um, the, like, yeah, the game's kind of easy. Also, the tracks are all, like, 20 seconds long. They are all very, very short. Um, this is padded out a little bit by the final races being five laps, but also... Say you're just doing the races that you really have to do, that's three laps in one race and five laps in another, which takes you maybe about four minutes total. That's what he's doing. He's doing crits. He's doing crits. I hate these guys. I haven't exactly gained a ton more money, have I? A little bit more, but not a ton more. And it was odd again. He's not liking this. He's not having a good time. Surely you jest! Church is making a killing off this. Uh, so yeah, so it's about four minutes a cup. And I said there were five cups. So 20 minutes. And then time set by three difficulties and you're at an hour. And yeah, like, you know, maybe it takes a little longer than that, but yeah, that's kind of it. It is a very short game. Uh, there are some bonus missions, some bonus levels, just some kind of bonus modes, but nothing really too much going on. The weapons are pretty straightforward, uh, albeit the UI doesn't really <laughs> telegraph what you've got very much. You just have to know by the abstract arrangement of dots what <laughs> weapon you've got. It's consistent. But it's not clear on a first play. It's like, what do all these dots mean? Um, the music is like just early 2000s trance techno, um, which is very fun just as a time capsule. Uh, game runs all right. Uh, Europe only as well, which is a curious release, but uh, yeah, curious release. I don't know if it's really great, but curious. So, yeah, other than that, that was an hour and a half, and I beat, like, ten games in the past week. I, I, I'm i a little exhausted out of that, so... Uh, why don't I switch gears, switch topics, uh, and we jump onto something that uh, is pertinent to everyone. Uh, politics. Nah. <laughs> um, but there is a, an extent of, um, like... I... how do I phrase this? Twitter sometimes leaks out into the rest of the world, and to some degree, I mean, Twitter is... filled with... some real people who take it seriously, and therefore the criticisms and the, uh, recommendations and suggestions and just anything people learn, and to, to be honest, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm sort of influ influenced by that as well. Um, but like, uh, some people take Twitter to be like, does it matter? Does it not matter? Um, some people take it to matter. And I think for me, it's like, I personally don't try to let Twitter affect, you know, me. Uh, but I am concerned about when something expressed through Twitter or kind of, uh, voice on Twitter and really any social media is starting to become representative of something outside of it or like, it is the way that some company is communicating how it will do stuff in the future in a way that's like, uh, don't really want that. Uh, and the catalyst for this is, uh, Capcom Localization Team's Twitter, um, issued a very, very long tweet, uh, consisting of basically eight 
not too long, but Ian Lee's face paragraphs uh, describing what is localization. Uh, not really with any context, but certainly in the grand scheme of uh, people have been complaining about the Sweet Baby Ink stuff and, and probably lots of stuff. Uh, journalists again. Journalists are complaining about some games again and then they praise certain things and... Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. It, journalism is in a weird spot where it seems kind of disingenuous and... I would love to be able to chat to actual journalists to try to understand their perspectives more. Because right now, from my perspective, I'm like, man, they don't represent me. They, they don't, like, I don't feel like they actually speak things that I care about, or that I, like, I actually feel. And in turn, that means I discount all their opinions, I just throw it in the trash, and whatever these, you know, gaming publications who are using journalism to provide, you know, like, I, I don't want to say, you know, sorry, uh, publications being the actual journalist, uh, game publishers, I'm not saying that game publishers use journalists to basically promote games, although, effectively, that's what the whole point of the press is in terms of a media space, is to provide, you know, discussions to provide, like, that kind of stuff. I mean, there's more roles that journalists should be doing. They should be shining lights on things that are wrong. They should be, um, you know, get, getting sneak peeks and that kind of stuff, um, which are not necessarily, you know, what the, what the publishers want to release right now. Um, not saying leaks, but just, you know, like, get, getting useful bits of information, that kind of stuff. Um, effectively, a lot of journalism now is just the journalists get the things that they, uh, you know, that they're really told to produce, and then they produce it, and then it's like, oh, okay. And I, I do feel like a lot of journalists are afraid to really say negative things about game publishers. If game publishers will quickly go, you're blacklisted, we're not giving you any review copies or whatever, you're going to be behind the curve because you're not going to be playing this game for long amounts of time before it comes out. Uh, which means your review can't come out as soon, or be as accurate, and therefore your publication will suffer. Um, to which I say, I wish every, like, game journalist site just did that. Like, just stop accepting stuff. Does it mean that consumers will basically go in blind because now journalists don't exist? I guess. And that's something that the game, you know, consumers need to figure out, is like, hey, yeah, like, like, I guess a lot of people really want to play games day one, and they don't even read the journalists anyway, so... My point is moved. Anyway, going back to this localization thing, the localization topic is a, um... I guess it's, it's a, uh... Uh, what's the term? It's a thread along... I guess people saying it's Gamergate too, but I don't know, to me it's like, it's still kind of in the same bubble. Gamergate has sort of been around this kind of degree of, uh... Partially, it's it's about the journalism stuff, and partially it's about uh, a sort of un. Uh, if I say unnatural, I mean like it's in inorganic. It's like a like a push towards certain kinds of content and certain kinds of engagement that doesn't seem like it's actually expressed by the majority of the, of the public or the the users of of these games. It's just like yeah, you know, like. You know, we, we want we want games to be more inclusive and 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 uh and this this article. Let me just read out or, or this thread. Let me just read out the the top paragraph. So, what is localization? Embark on a global adventure through the lens of game localization. Beyond mere translation, we're diving into the arts of cultural adaptation. Uh, sorry, ad adaptation, preserving context, and inclusive storytelling. Join us as we unravel the intricacies that make games resonate worldwide. See, this is the, the, like, <laughs> this is the problem with the world, but, like, this is, this is the, like, the issue I've, you know, I've found right away is the, like, the arts of cultural adaptation, preserving context, and inclusive storytelling. It's like, okay, it's a couple of things I'm very much on preserving context. Like, my my gut opinion is games should be as, you know, generally as pure to the creator's vision as possible. I know I say this playing Dragon Quest, which is famous for having 
very, very wacky and goofy translations, but I feel like Dragon Quest is very exceptional because one, I do kind of like the translations, um, and also I think it is, you know, it has been blessed with the creator's, um, I guess like, you know, approval, where this is the kind of work that he wants to present for the Western markets and, uh, you know, whatever, the translation in the Japanese, which is a lot more straightforward medieval, um, or fantasy rather, not medieval. Um, like a lot of these enemy names, they get wacky in the uh, translations for Dragon Quest IV onwards. Um, I think ultimately, you know, like, you, keeping the characters pretty pure, as well as giving it personality, is the main goal. And it's got the, it's got the, I guess, the approval of the, of, of the original creators. Um, I think as long as people are very aware that it is slightly different as well. Um, then I guess it's alright, but I guess, for me as a non-Japanese speaker, I, uh, I can't tell you how much of any of these localization attempts are actually that good or bad, which I guess is a big problem. The best I can say is, based on things I've seen, you know, do I feel like the localization has been accurate or not? And do I feel like it detracts from the game overall? I don't particularly have a lot of great examples that I've personally played. And this is where, and I'll, I'll, I'll lean into, um, like, this being a, a soft opinion. I'm not particularly, like, I don't have a strong foot in, like, games not being localized. But I have my gut feeling. And I would prefer the discussion to just be like, yeah, that's it. What do we want games to be? I don't think there's a right or a wrong way, but I do think that there is, like, you know, certainly one that I prefer. That's it, really. So, uh, other than that, the intricacies that make games resonate worldwide is sort of a, uh, you know, uh, I guess that's a, that's a bit of a loaded phrase in the sense of, why do games resonate worldwide? Well, it actually can be for, like, quite a bunch of reasons, but also... Does a game resonate worldwide because of the localization? And I feel like that's... not exactly true. It can be true. But it's not exactly true. I think games resonate worldwide mostly because they have fun stories, or they have fun mechanics. And the localization is a means to convey that same excitement to different audiences in not the original language. That's what I feel localization is for. Localization is not necessarily the reason why the games resonate. It is just a piece of why the games should be, you know, can resonate. So let's continue on. Uh, all of these start off with a headline, but they're all like two sentences. Uh, not just translating. Localization isn't just about translating words. It's about adapting the game for a global audience. Think cultural nuances, idioms, and regional flair. A good localization makes players feel right at home, wherever in the world they are. Now that is... Slightly true, but not entirely. There is a degree of, you cannot do a direct, literal translation of the Japanese. And also, this is Capcom, so I assume everything has to be in Japanese originally? Like, can they not be in Japanese? Does Capcom have any non... like... non-English, non-Japanese games that they localize? I'm not sure if they do. Um... I like how I'm just going around punching the dudes, man. You gotta punch them. Bro, where are they hiding? Um, but yeah, do I want players to feel right at home? It's like, well, oh, I don't know if right at home. Like, I think there's a degree of a Japanese game will forever be Japanese in in feeling, and I think that that's okay. Or alternatively, a Japanese game tries to break the barrier. Metal Gear Solid is a classic example because Metal Gear Solid is a Japanese game intended for Western audiences. Um, but it, I guess it also works worldwide if you just provide Japanese subs, but it's in English. The, the dub, is, I think, Metal Gear Solid is originally dubbed in English. So, like, that one's a curious one because it breaks the, you know, the whole localization 
well, not so localized, but like, it breaks the barriers a little bit. It's intended for a specific vibe and a specific market, and, um, like, that, I think, is actually why Metal Gear Solid is so well-loved, is that it is such a very pure translation of a creator's vision. Um, what I don't necessarily want is for someone's crazy, wacky idea to be somehow comforted down into me. Uh, into, into my kind of language or, or lingua. I'm perfectly okay with games not being in English originally to maintain some of those original cultural intentions if it makes sense in the context of that game. I think there's a lot of, you know, JRPG games where it's like, I think that actually doesn't make sense. Um, probably, I, I'm not going to be saying a blanket statement on like, every game should do this or every game should do that. I think I'd probably evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. But I wouldn't exactly blanket say all games need to have, like, you know, Western idioms, because then we get, like, games start saying, like, uh, a classic one is, uh, that means raw in Dragon. That's a line in Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy Fire Emblem Fates, uh, which I feel like just doesn't really age. It doesn't fit, like, what I've played of Fire Emblem. And, uh, and that one's a Nintendo Treehouse translation, so that's, again, it's not Capcom. I can't, I can't exactly call upon anything that Capcom's translated and then gone, yeah, like, that sucks. Um, best I can say is, no, I haven't played a Capcom game in a while. I do enjoy their, um, Ace Attorney translations. And that was a very tricky one as well, because you have to convey everything through dialogue. Like, that, that is probably the one where the, tra the translator has such an important role. Pretty much visual novels, because it's like, oh, like, the mechanics are not clear-cut right there. Um, we might as well proceed over east, because uh, I'm not making any progress by walking around grinding. We need some stronger enemies. Welcome to our inn. We hope we let you in. Uh, so let's go on to the next paragraph. The importance of context. Lost in translation? Nah. Preserving the vibe is key. Jokes, references, and even gameplay elements might need a little cultural remix. Uh, it's important to find that sweet spot to make sure players get the intended experience without feeling like something's got lost in the process. Now, the second, the last sentence there, I agree, but... Jokes, references, and even gameplay elements might need a little cultural remix. Now, again, I'm not gonna blanket say everything, but I'm... I'm a little skeptic about that, because I don't want, like... I think a classic is like, you know, costumes being changed for Western markets. It's like, well, I... Uh, I think we're past that point. Like, if you're a mature rated game, or even your T-rated game, like, you're not doing this for age ratings boards. You know what I mean? Like, if the age rating board is okay with it, then... Why not? Like, that used to be the, like, not even... I don't want to say the scapegoat, but you know what I mean? It's like, games used to be censored to get within a certain age rating. We got this tunnel from the first game. You know... The long as heck tunnel. That's not that long, actually. <laughs> Better could see through the smoke. Um... Yeah, it, it, I, I'm not the biggest fan of... changing things for the sake of changing things because you think the Western market will approach it better, because I think as well, games are so large now, and also, games media sort of don't have much of a pull anymore, that I don't think any particulars of games are really that significant either way in terms of their sales. So to a, to a game publisher, which ultimately that is your goal, by the way, is to make sales, so... Un underline everything by, if it's not for sales, what on earth are they doing? And, uh... Some people have an idea. Uh, I will I, I will call it a theory right now, but some people have an idea. Um, moving on, bridging the linguistic gap. Each language has its unique structure and cultural context. Our teams work to ensure the narrative and dialogue maintain coherence and emotional impact. It's not just about words, it's about capturing the essence of the story in a way that resonates with the target audience. 
Uh, that is also... No, actually, I'm gonna disagree with that. I, I, I was like, I was like, is that, is that right? And I'm like, no. You should not be targeting your story or adapting your story to target the audience. You should be... Ta you should be tra translating the feelings from the story in as best a way possible. This castle is uh, not as it was, but it also was the end boss castle. At least that bridge is still here, you know what I mean? Other than that, we got a, we got a, a doozy of a dungeon again. That's right. All my homies love the doozy dungeon. Let's see how well I can actually do this. Because we're gonna have some mummy mans, everyone's favorite. So I like how I've got like a surround now. How strong are the mummies? They got a bit of health. They, they've got a bit. The gremlins are probably on their way out, but oh, they're hitting kind of hard. Thirteen's a bit. Thirteen's a bit mean. Yeah. We'll see how far I get, I guess. But I feel like it's better to start making progress like this, because then also if I can get some of the uh, some of the chests, then that saves a bit of effort trying to go around again. I think we are sort of bound to... Oh my gosh, cloth! We're sort of bound to just making our way downtown. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's right for games to, or for localizers to, to be targeting the audience, if that makes sense. Like, the creators in a different language intended it to mean one thing. Don't be adding in some other meaning because you think and this is the important thing. It might be educated, but to think that a, a different audience would respond to it better. I would prefer to go with the original designer's gut feeling, because we may get into the situation where the localizer changes it, makes it worse, and now who do I attribute this to? Do I attribute it to the localizer? Do I attribute it to the writer? I can't tell. So I'm... I'm... You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't know where to reason with that. So I'm like, okay, well, it just all sucks, and everyone associated with it is responsible, which is not, you know, that's not a great scenario for games to be in. It's like, oh, you know, it all kind of sucks, and it's because someone in the pipeline botched it up for everyone. You know what I mean? Get all mid-fight healing. I think it's a pretty straightforward dungeon for the moment. Also, uh, make sure I have enough magic for uh, both outside and return. I need 12 left over. <laughs> also, does this mean I should sell my, uh, my warp wings? Probably. Lots of mummy men. Man. Burning through that magic quick, I tell ya. Uh, anyway, next, next, uh, paragraph. Cultural sensitivity in characters. Uh, character design and development must be culturally sensitive. What may be acceptable in one culture might be offensive in another. Localizers play an important, or a crucial role in ensuring the characters are relatable and respected, uh, respectful, avoiding stereotypes or other references that could be perceived as negative in specific cultures. To this, again, did the original designer intend for it? If so, hmm, because if the original designer didn't intend for it to be disrespectful, then are you just seeking disrespect, if you know what I mean? Are you just kind of, you know, are you a hammer and everything looks like a nail? You know what I mean? Uh, oh, gosh. There we go. Oh. Gosh, I am so tired of, like, fighting all these money man, I'll tell ya. Oh. 
This may be a doozy, because I hit run. <laughs> I might hit run again. <laughs> That's what I get for hit and run. I, I would have had it, but I <laughs> flipped over, hit run, I was like, eh. I also love how, like the first game, the music just gets <laughs> a bit more demented as you keep going on. Man, I'm gonna be pushing for it, I tell ya. I might have to, like, start running near the end here. Um... But yeah, I, I, like, I think a classic is various, um... Uh, what did Koei Tecmo very quite often has done this, where they've censored character designs. Um, basically, they you know add a bit more clothing, and this is one where it's like culturally sensitive. It's like, I, is it offensive? Who's taking offense to there being just a little bit less clothing? Is it the ratings board? Because if it's the ratings board, okay, I get it. But I don't know if it always is. What is Medusa? Or oh, Gorgonzola. Anyway, to the next point. Inclusive language and representation. Localization efforts extend to promoting inclusivity through language and representation. This involves adapting not only the linguistic aspects, but also addressing gender-specific language, cultural norms, and diverse perspectives. The aim is to create an immersive experience where players from different backgrounds can identify with the characters and narrative. Uh, this can be very challenging for certain languages due to grammar. Um, to this, I, I'm just like, uh, I don't seek representation in my games, because I am not represented in many of them, and I just don't think it's very valuable if, like, like, I don't gain much if it ever happens, so I'm like, okay, sure. It's freaking Gorgonzola, I tell you that. Oh, I'm cutting, I'm riding the line. I'm really riding the line here, oh my gosh. I am getting experience though. This is this is a worthy moment of the heal more. Uh okay, almost there, I guess. Alright, so we got a staircase down and a staircase up. So I think if you take the staircase up. Ah, Nah, I'm, go I'm gonna bail from this one. Ah, uh, no! But, uh, but yeah, also, yeah, gender-specific language, it's like, well, fortunately, Japanese doesn't have too much gender-specific language, but also, like, words that specifically relate to the gender of something. Like, I, I don't know, it's a weird thing to, to mention. And again, if you're changing it from the creator's vision because you, the localizer, think that, oh, the audience can't handle that, and you don't get the, like, the sign-off, really... There you go, fine. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just want to keep going for a bit. Okay. There we go. The staircases keep going around a bunch, but uh, this gives you the, the Lotto Sword, which is uh, very important. So how about let's uh, move the sword off. The, uh, yeah, the Steel Sword. Pass that over to Nana. And Nana can give over the Lotto Sword to Bumbo. And now you can see the power. I mean, that, that was from no equipment, but still. The Lotto Sword is great. Let's, uh, let's cast outside. And then let's return, because, uh, I am not making it to the other side of this dungeon in time. But, at least that- that's at least the most important part there. Is to get that sword out. 
Also, I guess that sword kind of means we don't need the hammer, do we? Does that sword also have a, uh, an additional ability, or it's just, uh... It's just a good sword. Also, apparently, the, uh, the Prince of Canna can actually hold the sword in the, uh, in the Game Boy version. But, uh, we're not giving it to him. He doesn't need it yet. <laughs> okay, let's, uh... The best part as well, I'm pretty sure I can just do that, so... <laughs> That's probably a little easier to get here as well, let's <laughs> just take the boat. Yeah. Alright, uh... Two more paragraphs. Adapting humor and wit. Humor often relies on cultural references and wordplay, making it a challenging aspect of game localization. Translators must carefully uh, navigate puns, jokes, and cultural references... Oh, we gotta do this. Um, to maintain the intended comedic effect. This requires a deep understanding of the target audience's sense of humor while staying true to the original wit. Uh, okay, uh, like, in theory, I agree with the sentence, but in practice, uh, do I trust them to follow it? That's, a, again, a question. Um, I don't think that you should really be throwing in too much. Humor is definitely one where it's like, humor is very subjective. I don't have a real, like, art to it, so I don't know, someone might be like, you know, like, this joke actually really wouldn't land if you, if you kept, like, this here. So, adding this, you know, keeps a joke in play. Uh, sometimes I see that's the case. Um, but again, case-by-case case basis, I think, is probably my, my take on that one. Uh, final one. Consistency in terminology. Maintaining consistency in terminology is crucial for a smooth and coherent gaming experience. This applies not only to translating words, but also to ensuring that game mechanics, instructions, and lore are consistently represented across languages. <coughs> oh my gosh. Establishing a cohesive language system helps prevent confusion and enhances the overall gaming experience for players worldwide. Uh, I fully agree that consistency is great, although... Don't, like, throw in consistency where the game itself wasn't, like... You know, because this is, like, codified as, like, easy mode difficulties or that kind of stuff. Like, that's what I mean by when when they say, we make mechanics consistent. That actually might mean overhauling entire game systems because Western market just is too bad. They are too dumb. They can't they can't play games. Um, now, I'm not saying that's, that's the case all the time or a lot of the time, um, but certainly... Um, what was the well, the one um, unicorn overlord like specifically change easy normal hard or expert? They used expert was the English word already in the Japanese version, and they just replaced it with like normal, very like, like they replaced it with three just stupid not stupid but like just very excessive words. <laughs> and you didn't need to change them unless you wanted to make the easy difficulty seem. Like, it was actually the challenge, and every other difficulty is just harder. It's like, oh, okay. That's one where it's like, oh, if the original creator agreed with that, then okay, I guess, but... Mm, I got my doubts there. Um, there are some things as well where it's like, um, I think like a modern trend. It's not... I, you can probably find a lot of older games that do this, but it is a, a good thing I agree with is, uh, you know when you play a game and, like, certain keywords and dialogue is, like, highlighted red? That. That's a, that's a good thing. And that's not necessarily a localization thing, but I think that, like, that, that's one thing that I think is important for some games to carry over in localization, is sometimes, you know, a word needs to be stressed, and really that should be... The designers should make it very easy for the localizers to, you know, softball it, get them to go, hey, look, that word's important. That's the word we want players to be seeing. So I think the far staircase actually shortcuts a little bit, and I might actually take that one instead. Lots of Gorgonzolas. Uh, but... Again, I don't know what the context of, uh... This, um... This, uh, tweet from Capcom specifically was. Um... But it's definitely, you know, you, you look at the tweets and you go, like, this is terrible. And I'm like, I, I know where this is, like, represented. In a vacuum, this seems okay, but I, I, I've spotted where this kind of discussion has come from. 
And I think that this is like, this is not exactly helpful. Really, and again, again, really all, I think what really helps us a ton is transparency, because this is such a very, like, neatly put together little essay. It's not, it's not an essay, but it's like it's a neatly put together little, little, you know, presentation so that people understand what localization really is and how hard it is and all that stuff. And it's like, it's not about that. It's that localization has a clear start and end point. The starting point is an unknown. And the more users feel frustrated, the more they will go through effort and means to circumvent what you are doing. They will, like, try to play Japanese version, because that's the, that's the fun part as well. Um, consoles are not region locked as much anymore. The Switch is not region locked. If you are upset about how games look in Japanese, uh, sorry, look in English, you can easily change the Switch and play it in, in Japanese. Um, you might have to rebuy, you might have to buy uh, a Japanese version. Um, but in theory, it's like, yeah, like, you could just buy the Japanese version if you don't like the English versions. The Basilisk. Has this guy got a lot of health? I don't know. Is this a snake? We're wandering through the tunnel. Still going through the tunnel. All right, we're finally here, almost at the end. We're gonna deal with uh this, the danger floor, where you lose seven health a pop. This is a pain and a half. I should probably use the healing herbs that I have. Or the ring, actually. We use the ring on the way back. This is very important because you get some money! And the world map! Oh my gosh! Check this out. Ready? Oh, I can't be see You can't see it here. The steel plate? And the strasseed? Oh, I've got... Uh... I guess I'll get rid of one, one repellent because I'm not going to use that. And we'll use a herb on mana. And then this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. Just trying to sort through this inventory. Alright. Use that on Bundo. And I think we're good, yeah. I just need to wander back. Ah, oh, dang it! The one person who was not meant to die. And as long as they don't spawn enemies on me, I'm okay. But they probably will. Actually, you gotta fight a boss, don't you, at the end here? Yeah. Do you? I don't think you actually do have to fight a boss. I think he's just chilling here. Uh, I don't think there's any. Yeah, these are these are lighter, lighter damage tiles. Yeah, here he is. Good of you to come, Bundo. I am the great grandson of the King of Kings, Draco Lord. I have heard some Her Hargon fancies himself to be something special and carries on as if he were so. I am not amused. But you agree to eliminate Hargon? I will tell you a secret, well? Yeah, sure. Ah, you'll do it then. Good. Collect the five seals. That will give you the protection of an elemental spirit. There is a small island south of the town that was once known as Mercado. That is where you must first go. Without the five seals and without the power of the elemental spirit, Hargon cannot be defeated. Uh, also, with Art Dead, I um, can't evac. Uh, Art must live to. Oh, well, that's because he's holding it. Hold on. Pass it to Nana? Can Nana use it? <laughs> I really want to bail from here. Nope, I can't bail. Well, this this might be this might be a, a loss of a rather significant amount of money, which is a bit sad. But 
we'll see. We'll see how I do. What a shame if I was just slightly more careful as well. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll t oh my gosh, one, one step. Alright, we're just gonna run and we're gonna hope. Mm, I, I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna make it all the way out of here, I tell ya. There's also fewer targets. How could you die? How could you do- Oh my gosh, and I have to pay? So not only do I lose half my money, right? Because that's- Yeah, you lose half your money and you gotta pay for this. What a, what a joke. Um, 260 gold? Oh my gosh. Uh, there we go. So I guess there's, there's one last thing I want to do before the end of stream. Um, but uh, I, I guess uh, ultimately, with this like localization thing, you know, like one, it's I I do see some people that I follow really taking this seriously. And they're like, they're starting to throw out the very long terms. I, I think the one that I see a bunch is like, uh, and this one, this one will uh, put me on a, put the video on a, a fun list if I say the term cultural Marxism. But it's like, I don't know, man. I don't, I'm not very, you know, in tune with history or geography to know like where some of these ideas and things come from. Um, I just sort of like see it as I, or, you know, I read it as I see it. I basically go, is this okay, or is this not okay? And in terms of game localization, I think I've sort of seen this trend of self-censorship, where publishers censor things, um, not really out of, like, an expression of, uh, you know, making the game better, or making it relate to an audience more, which is fun that they say that quite a bunch in this, uh, in this tweet. Also, that was one singular tweet, by the way, it was just a very long tweet. Um, but certainly this idea of, um, forcing language, enforcing ideals, um, and that's the kind of, uh, I guess, idea that some of these other creators that I follow, like, that's how they like phrasing it, um, and that's what motivates them and galvanizes them into going, this, you know, this, uh, cultural imperialism, they, they'll say, uh, cultural is at the beginning of both of these terms. Um, that this, uh, this is just the, the weaker one, the Medusa Eye. Um, by, by phrasing it like this, they make it seem like there is, you know, like, a, a huge uh, culture war, um, going on. Uh, maybe it does exist? I don't know exactly. Um, I, but I feel like I don't really, I mean, I don't have a lot of opinions of my own on this kind of topic. I see it a bunch. And I'm sort of like, I get swept up into it a little bit. I definitely have some strong opinions. Like, I really think that me personally have fall- I've fallen out so much with what journalism means, and now I have a very strong opinion of I wish journalism was better. Um, and to some degree, you know, can I really change it as one person? I don't know. Here's the town, by the way. Um, I think if we just sail up, we should spot... Hey, yeah, it's literally just up. Oh. What's this? A sunken treasure? That's the treasure. It was just chilling there. I don't exactly give you a great clue, but it's like, hey, you just have to kind of know that it was up there. And it's, it's clear when you see it. Jellyfish. Too bad we're not letting him letting him live. Oh, 
on that. We're making good progress. We're, we're on to... Um, well, now we've got this quest where you need to go around and find the five seals. And that sort of is the, um... The, the goal for the rest of the game is to, is to navigate around and figure out where these seals are. This does lead into, um, sort of crazy open-endedness. Oh, but wait, I've got a world map! Well, I don't know if that world map's in the original version or whether it's actually in this version only. But it might help a ton. At least I'm getting my money back-ish. My poor money. Uh, so if we view this... There you go, this gives you a good vibe as to what's going on. So this is our world map. Uh, we started on the northeastern continent there, kind of on that bite going on, uh, and wandered kind of up and over, and the, the tall part of the middle continent, uh, just kind of almost sticking up there, there was a little tunnel that led across the water, and that's how we managed to go south, and there on, uh, and then followed around the north coast of that all the way up to the side, and, uh, Alfgaard is basically the square continent that's just southeast of the, the feather right here. Uh, the entire world, also, Al Alfgaard is to scale. Every block is still there, every every grid tile is still the same as it was in the original Dragon Quest 1. So, it just occupies like a 25th of the overall space of the map. It's... I'm shocked and impressed, and I, I love the idea of scale, of uh, just how much more Dragon Quest 2 has. Um, even if, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's more spread out, like the world is much larger, and then uh, proceeds to only have, like, double the number of dungeons. But we've definitely seen a fair bit so far, and uh, the goal of finding these seals is uh, sort of just, you're free to go wherever, um, because I don't think really anything else is off limits now that I've got a ship. So we'll basically spend the next stream going around and finding some seals and hopefully being underleveled. But I do have uh, the Sword of Lotto, so there is that. And for reference, there are much better swords as well. Let's head back here. Let's actually see if the if the um will the dock guy comment on a uh, oh, what the boats up there. <laughs> Let's ask the dock guy. Poggers, hey, yes, sir, dude. You've caught me right at the end of the stream, unfortunately. But, uh, I've made good progress. Ah! You recovered my treasure! That will save me from bankruptcy! Thank you ever so much. Please take the Echo Flute as my thanks. It is a family heirloom. This is important for later, though. But it's for later. I might as well clear my inventory a little bit as well, just before I, before I hop. Because I picked up some other stuff as well. I still have gotten no more gambling tokens. I can't gamble more in this game. Uh, okay. I don't need herb? Here's the thing, poison doesn't come up anymore. <laughs> it was there at the beginning of the game, and now it's like, eh. Because it doesn't matter, especially when you've got a character who can heal poison anyways, and they know that, so they're just like, yeah, okay. Um, but I kind of like this idea that, like, everything is now open. Every- like, you can go anywhere at this point in the game. And this is the end of stream number two. You know, like... This this game doesn't, you know, it doesn't waste your time. Or it does waste, it actually does, will waste my time at some point. But, uh... It certainly will, uh... Will, uh, go by quite quicker than I expected. That's cool. Uh, there's the Echo Flute. Goodbye, herbs. Goodbye, repellent. Goodbye, random cloth. Goodbye, steel sword that you were holding on to. Oh my gosh, that was a fair bit, wasn't that? 11.25? Whoa! There's the world map, and there's your steel armor, which I don't need. 7.50, there we go. And if I did need it, well, I guess I can just get a bit more money and go for that, so... Uh, okay, now we're just gonna find where the save guy was. Is it? My brain's thinking upstairs here. Nope. That's- <laughs> that's the bank. Oh, it's down below. That's where it was. 
But yeah, moral of the story is, uh, people are taking things very seriously on the internet, and all I want is, uh, good games and stuff like that, and more games like the Talos Principle too. Think about it, they had to translate it from Croatian into, I don't know if they ever wrote it in Croatian, but, uh, we'll get, we'll get some stats numbers. 14716, 14115, 11693. So yeah, for reference, I think the max level is at a million experience. It starts accelerating, it starts accelerating pretty hard. Uh, but with that, I would like to thank you all so very much for watching. If you enjoyed this stream or you missed parts of it, you can uh, see the VOD on Twitch for a week and it'll be on YouTube uh, within 24 hours or so. Uh, and if you missed last week's stream, go watch that as well. That's available there as well. Um, uh, yep, yeah, I'll stream next week. You know the drills. 8.30 p.m. Australian Eastern uh, Standard Time. Uh, are we in Standard Time right now? We are in Standard Time right now. Yes. Um, so that's that, which is yeah, same time next week. Uh, you can follow on Pluroma, where I say some things sometimes, at m.bnd.com. Uh, and uh, other than that, that's kind of it. I, I feel like I've just discussed, like, oh, I play like bajillions of games this week. Um, and maybe I'll play a bajillion more, but, uh, I've, <laughs> I don't know, we'll see. Uh, so, until then, stay safe, eat your greens, don't stay up too late, and, uh, remember to, uh, what was the one? Don't, pl I play Guitar Hero 2, that game's great. That was probably the best game I've played all, uh, in quite a while, so. Anyways, have a good one, everyone, peace!